around human performance, but mostly has focused on sport and sport performance. He worked with the men's lacrosse and women's lacrosse programs in their load monitoring, monitoring program. I believe we'll talk a fair amount about that today. He currently serves <coughs> as the director of the Walker Human Performance Laboratory over in Turner Hall and mentors many student senior research projects. Um, on the professional side, he currently serves as the Mid-Atlantic Regional Coordinator for the National Strength and Conditioning Association and as a grant panel reviewer for the NSCA's foundation. He's also an active member and um, of the American College of Sports Medicine. So with that, I give you Dr. Collins. successful. 
Uh, here's a look at uh, what it would take to do a two-hour marathon. Uh, and this was produced before we thought two-hour marathon was even considered possible. Uh, we really didn't think we were going to get there. We'll probably get there in uh, my lifetime. Um, I thought maybe my kid's lifetime would be the first, first time we see a two-hour marathon. But what we need to do all these things is this interplay between uh, physiology and, and basic physics, right? You need to be able to move a body 26.2 miles at a given velocity. That takes a given amount of energy to do that, and you need things to run that energy system. You need nutrition, you need oxygen, you need your blood vessels to pump, uh, uh, heart pump appropriately. Um, you need to have quick ground reaction time. You have to have a long stride. Um, you have to consider the body's body type. You have to be relatively lightweight. You have to have long, thin limbs so you can you know, move relatively effectively, but also dissipate the heat you're creating uh, just by doing the action of running at that speed. So a two hour marathon is about a 432 mile pace uh, for 26.2 miles. So that's, that's, that's pretty um, uh, intense if you look at it. Uh, but if you look at, um, we have Ryan Hall over here, which is probably one of the, the US's best chance for, well, for a long time at, at marathon uh, glory. Um, and this is just him doing slow motion. This is kind of the impact forces necessary to to be successful at a two hour and three marathon pace. So he has hit the ground with about 500 pounds of force. Now, I, I, we're not gonna get on a rabbit hole of technology and sport, but it, it's hard pressed to, to mention two hour marathons nowadays without thinking about the shoe technology and everything that has added to um, the efficiency of the human body uh, around these variables and how does the shoe actually improve that condition and they are playing a role in that process. Uh, from another end of the spectrum, let's look at, uh, uh, look at this from another angle is, well, you know, then you have endurance sport versus sprint sport. And, you know, technique is relatively the same in terms of the running. We see Usain Bolt on, on one side, you see Ryan Hall again on another, looking at two different activities requiring a similar technique just in different physiological demands. One very aerobic, uh, one very anaerobic, lots of power de development here. Usain Bolt is putting a thousand pounds of force into the ground in uh, 0.1 seconds, right? So that's a very, very intense activity with respect to what we're looking at from a sport perspective. Now, these are complicated in and of themselves, understanding marathon and sprint dynamics. But when we look at our, our sports, we have a, a number of different qualities or types of sport. One of the ones that I've been working with uh, in association with Dr. Bowman, whose picture will be up here a few times, uh, is territorial invasion uh, uh, sports. Um, so territorial invasion sports are games or competitions in which the aim is to invade opponent's territory to score a point or score a goal. Um, and these are typically characterized by an intermittent, multi-directional, high-intensity effort interspersed with some level of active recovery, which is consistent with you know, low-intensity walking, uh, low-intensity running or jogging. Right? So that's typically what we're, we're characterizing these sports are. Um, and as a result, they have an extensive aerobic and anaerobic demand, resulting in a need for a, a, a broad range of physiological capabilities. They have to be able to have a good aerobic engine. They have to have a good top end engine, which is you know, anaerobic capacity. They have to be able to accelerate and decelerate and move that center of mass in different directions. That's our agility. Uh, they have to have hand, hand or hand foot eye coordination, uh, et cetera. There's a ton of things we have to consider. So what kind of sports are these? You know, these are hockey, field hockey, or if you, in Europe, uh, ice hockey and hockey, um, rugby, basketball, football, and then the two we'll be focusing on soccer and, and lacrosse. That's the, the groups we've been working with here uh, with respect to our process here. So things we've been doing with our team. So this is what we're trying to accomplish. One of the things we really need to know is what does it take to play these sports? What are the actual demands that this sport entails or these sports entail that we can then hopefully program or train around uh, in order to get the best performance out of these activities. And for a long time, what we could only do is do lab and field tests and just hopefully look at their correlation and put them in the field. And hopefully if you got stronger and faster in the gym, 
you were potentially stronger and faster on the field, that probably led to greater sport performance. Um, but with the advent of uh, GPS being in a much smaller and smaller form, uh, we were able to uh, uh, procure a few different uh, systems. The major system that we use is called Sport Performance Tracking. Uh, it's a GPS platform out of Australia. Um, we received this through alumni donations and uh, Dr. Bowen and myself uh, received a grant from USA Lacrosse to help drive all of this process. We couldn't thank them enough for, for allowing this to happen. But GPS units record uh, at 10 hertz recording, they, they look at the three satellites, and as a result we get a, new, a number of different variables that uh, relate to what's happening on the field. Um, we don't have to videotape them, we could, but that was kind of an old school method. Now we can look at live tracking, where are they going, what are they doing, how fast are they moving, and we can get distances covered at various speeds, we can get the overall work rate in which they're uh, participating, and then the companies themselves have come out with these, um, not arbitrary, but uh, some sort of proprietary algorithm to assess what's the overall load they experience. Um, and we typically call this intensity or 2 and 3D load. Um, I'm not going to incorporate those into the discussion just because they're not really transferable uh, between different units. So if we use another unit system, you know, the speeds and the work rates would translate very effectively, but the, the algorithms used to describe intensity are, are not uniform. So um, we can't really compare across models with those. It is a, a, a current concern with our research when we're looking at some of the reporting. Um, so for our, from, from our methodological perspective, um, we've really looked at men's lacrosse and women's soccer. That's been our two buy-in programs is what we've been able to accomplish. Um, in, and it started with soccer. So soccer, I approached the coach, uh, Coach Olson, and said, hey, I saw a presentation at ACSM about X, Y, and Z. What do you think about doing this? He's like, let's do it. And was able to fundraise and got um, 12 units at first, and we've, we've grown that in, uh, to about 24 units, with almost the whole team being, being tracked. Whereas the, the lacrosse system was, was purchased based on a, a grant from USA Lacrosse, and we can get all 54, give or take, injuries, et cetera, athletes track during the games. Uh, for lacrosse, we break it down by position. Uh, our attack, defense, offensive, midfield, defensive, midfield, which does incorporate a, what we call a long stick midi. Um, we, one of our projects, the student decided that to, to separate a short stick midfield from a long stick midfield. Uh, it was pretty interesting uh, results we got off that. We have face off and goal, which are, we classify as our specialists. And then in soccer, the classic positions for us, we just dictate them as forward, midfield, defense, and goalie. I know if you get into uh, really good soccer nomenclature, you know, midfield is broken up into different units like wings and centers and defense and center backs, et cetera. But for our purpose, how our teams typically have worked, they've just been generalized in terms of what they're looking at. Um, and one of the key factors that we want to identify, is, this will come up later, is um, who qualified to be analyzed during our competitions versus non-competitions. And that was classified based on how much of the competitions did they participate in. Um, during a competition, did they play greater than 50% of that game? Um, and then some of the things, did we, they play more than 50% of the competitions for some of the, the analysis that we looked at. Um, but one of the first things I ever did when I got here, and it took a little while to get out, but was just look at what is the characteristic of a cross player. Right, we looked at what is the skill set needed to be a marathon runner. I thought, well, let's kind of do a similar thing. We're doing some battery of tests on our lacrosse players. Let's look at what they are like. And this was a, a paper that we published in the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research um, with, with the, the coaches here, as well as uh, Dr. Smith. And this is kind of the descriptive that we came up with, right? So we're looking at, you know, uh, heights, 170, uh, eight inch, uh, centimeters, that's what we're looking at. You know, five eight to six one uh, athletes with uh, you know 148 to 210 pounds, uh, a, a good variety with with a body fat of uh, 13 percent, which is which is a pretty low body fat for for what we're looking at. Some of the tests that they did that this was prior to us having a full time strength coach, so uh, the tests were a little bit more random than what we would like, but we we did get some good information out of it. We looked at how much could they hang power clean, how many bench press 
uh, reps could they do with their body weight? How many dips could they do? Uh, how many three yards, what was their time for their 300 yard shuttles? And then they did a mile. And for those who've been here a while, they did the midnight mile, uh, which was a, an event of itself. Uh, but when we look at their sport performance, things we want to identify <coughs> is a 300 yard shuttle, 55 to 60 seconds. If we look at some of these comparisons, when we look at how do they compare to other athletes, we don't have a lot of norms related to this type of activity where we have but for the most part, national level, level soccer player, that's about where our men's lacrosse program needs for anaerobic capacity. That's what the 300 yard shuttle tests. How well do they handle high intensity sprints? It's a 300 yard shuttle, 25 yards down, 25 yards down, back and forth until they, they're, they're done. And then their mile time, 528 to 609. If you do a very, the mile's not a great conversion, mile and a half is better, two miles even better. But if you look at it, we see about 47 to 52 milliliters per kg per minute in terms of an aerobic capacity, which is, which is pretty good for, for a field sport. It's not an endurance athlete, but it's a, a good aerobic engine for a field sport uh, type athlete. And then their body fat, which, which is a relatively average low uh, point for a male athlete. What we looked at with this is like, well, how does their body type actually uh, address or, or could, result in their tests. How does their body size, how does their body type actually address their, their physical performance in these tests? What we looked at is, well, how does body fat relate to the ability to do dips uh, and bench press? How many, how does your body fat result in your ability to run a mile? What about in, in terms of performing a 300 yard shot? What we found is that the more body fat an athlete was carrying, the harder it was to move their body mass through space. Um, it, it, it disrupted their ability to move effectively. And as a result, it made us realize that we do have to consider body fat even within an athlete like lacrosse where they do have to uh, you know, compete against someone physically and have to move another person. But body fat does have a negative impact on some of those performance metrics that we would be be valuing in something like lacrosse. But on the other side, fat-free mass is positively for uh, power development, that you have to have good muscle development to develop power. This is kind of like a, uh -huh, yeah, we know this, but we didn't know this in lacrosse at the time. This is a good piece of information to know that, hey, we should recognize that the, the body composition part is a part of the variables we have to consider when we work with athletes. But then we went into, you know, looking at our GPS stuff and, and you know, this data cannot, has not been um, easy to collect. It is very time consuming. A whole uh, repertoire of, of information gets done, but you need people to do it. And partnering with uh, Athletic Training and Dr. Bowman has allowed us to do this type of, of research, which is great to have hands on. And, um, some of the stuff I'll, I'll, I'll present is supported by the research that the students did. So we have JR, MJ, and Yasmin all participated in, at some level, collecting the data that I'm going to share with, with what we have here. So the first thing we looked at is, well, what is it like to, to, to play a game of lacrosse? What does it entail to do lacrosse on the day of the games? And how does the position affect what is actually happening? So here is a... Pretty informative uh, chart with result, result to like what is the total distance that they cover and how do they cover these distances at different speeds. So we have our, our different positions and then we have our speeds that the GPS dictates based upon meters per second, um, where we have our walk distance, jog distance, run distance, and sprint distance. And if we look at their total distances, um, the field players, specifically the defense and the attack, they're running about a 5K, or moving about a 5K a game. But what we're really interested is, well, how are they moving? Right? How are they moving during these games? You know, we think of it as, hey, they're doing a lot of movement. Okay, but what intensity are they doing a lot of this movement at? And if you look at their walk and jog distance, the, that makes up the vast majority, somewhere between 58 to 70, 80 percent of their game is done in walk or jog, or that active rest component, that active recovery, where their real sport performance is coming from their run distance and their sprint distances, with 
you know, if you think about the game of lacrosse and in soccer, this will come up as well. What do they get out of that sprint? How much do they sprinting? That's the sport performance. That's the end goal. That's where the goals are coming from. Those sprint uh, efforts. How many of those are they doing? Well, if we look down at what well, this is kind of a shocking. I was able to present this information at a strength and conditioning conference recently, and one of the things that we I ask who runs the most, uh, who does the most work. We typically look at you know things like the midfield, and then I say, well, how much do they run? And they typically were saying, oh, you know, you know, 10, 5 to 15 yards. That was the, the typical response that we got out of the group. But when we look at distance efforts based on the amount of distances that they actually are doing, we're actually seeing they're looking at more like 20 meters or 22, 23 yards uh, on average, right? So we're we're typically seeing somewhere between 10 to 30 meter runs on a regular. Uh, performance from a sprint perspective for uh, an athlete, and at a speed about 17 to, to 18 miles an hour, which is a pretty good clip for, for uh, a college athlete. Um, now, that's a, it's good information to know, but then we have to identify that there's nuances to these games. And one of the nuances was, this is a project that looked at the same data set and it was from Patrick Moore, which is one of our former undergrads who's now at Hopkins and playing lacrosse. And he wanted to know for his senior project, well, what if the competition changes? So we play a, a really robust schedule where we have a very high number of NCAA qualifying teams that we compete against and those that are not that level. And he broke it down into our high competition represented our uh, NCAA qualifying competitors and those who weren't were considered our low competition. And he wanted to look at, well, how does this change the metrics of, that we just saw in terms of the distances covered and at the various speeds that we were covering them. And what we saw is, uh, from, a, from a distance perspective, every group increased their uh, distance when we played a high competition game. Everyone started to bump up a little bit. However, the significant difference primarily came from the defense and the long stick meet. Um, when we looked at their walk distance, we see attack and defense spending a lot more time walking around. Uh, we said their jog also significant difference for the defense, a little bit more jogging and a little bit more uh, walking. When we start looking at the runs, we still see that same trend of more during the high competition, but it's the sprints that really come out. So the long stick bitty, the offensive, uh, the defensive bitty, and the defensive players. Those are the ones that are that seem to have the largest gain in sprint demands in, in a high competition game versus a low competition game. And if we look at overall work rate, what we found statistically was that the defense played the sig most significant role. Defensive midfield and defensive players had the biggest demands associated with playing a higher competition game. And our hypothesis primarily was, well, it's probably due to the fact that a defensive player is reacting to offensive moves where an offensive player is playing a planned uh, kind of uh, dance, right? So they're playing a, a planned setup where they're gonna do a certain amount of plays, they know where they have to be, and they practice those, and they do those in every game. So the difference is probably not that, that, that significant. Um, whereas a defensive player, while they try to plan for the best, and they have the, the, the good setup where they're practicing against a, a, a pretend uh, competitor, it's not the same. And, and they have to move a lot faster and move move a lot more. And then we also have a hypothesis that there's probably a lot more back and forth during the clear component in a high competition game than there would be in a low competition game. And what we really found was, well, look at those sprints again, where we do see significant difference in the high competition during the sprints and the number of sprint efforts. Well, what does that mean? Well, what we found is that low and high competition found no significant difference in the distance traveled per sprint. You still had to run 20 meters, 25 meters, a sprint in the game of lacrosse. The difference came primarily in how many of those did you have to do. And in a high competition, defense specifically, long stick mini specifically, and a defensive midfield, those typically had the largest gains in the amount of sprints that they had to do compared to, as well as attack, uh, as compared to those long, low competition games. So we still have to sprint the same, but we're doing more sprinting in the high competition game. Now that may trigger some uh, discussion about, 
uh, fatigue management and making sure that they have adequate rest period, nutrition, sleep after games, and that's kind of where our practice application comes through from, from adding to this set of information. Then we looked at, well, well, what happens with games versus practice, right? So that's a big issue, right? We, we play, you know, we have five practices, you know, two games a week, right? So six practices, two games a week. How do those intensities compare? From a physiological perspective, we want to we want to practice similar to our game intensity. We want to be prepared for those game intensities. But we also have to consider the load of practices are much more over time with five practices versus one game. So we do have to balance those things. We want the high intensity of practice equal to competition, but we also don't want to do too many of those during the week to, to impact the, the overall fatigue of the athlete. And what we found is for, for significant per purposes, you know, training was a much lower intense activity in terms of distance. We did a, a less, less walking, you know, we did a little bit less, uh, we did a little bit more jogging. Uh, in, in, in our training. When we look at our run distance, you know, a little bit less running in, in training versus games, and significant changes in our sprinting. We're not sprinting a lot during our, our practices. Uh, as a result, our workloads for certain groups, specifically our offensive midfield and our uh, face-off guys, spent a lot more of, a, of changes between our, our trainings and our so this is a nuance that we have to consider from, uh, this now becomes the art of coaching. I give this information to the coach, he has to figure out what to do with it. I can't tell him what to do. It's, <laughs> he's way more uh, attuned to this than I am. But we do find out there's a significant difference in the training component and the game. Um, and, and for better or for worse, you know, we can't have equal amount of load equal to the game all the time. So if we've now, Kind of a nuance from where I stand as a consultant with this is we do go to day to day, we do send the coach some information regarding, hey, this is a good practice, this is a hard practice, take a day off. So they do have it kind of periodized, which is um, really fun to look at if you're really getting into the, the day to day, the nitty gritty. Um, and the last one I wanted to look at is what happens to your starters and non starters during practices? Um, it's always a concern to, from the research perspective, we see in soccer. This is a concern, specifically in preseason soccer. The starters spend all the load, they do all the work. They're the ones who are the most fit, they're the ones who are required to do a lot of the work. And as a result, that might you know, trickle down to the season in terms of fatigue. But in, in lacrosse, I wanna know, is that the same or is that different? Um, and what we found is, for the most part, our, our, our team does a pretty good job of balancing out um, starter and non-starter activity. And my hypothesis is probably due to the fact that we have scout teams, right? So half the group is a scout team for the offense and defense from our, our competitor that week. The other group is they're running their offense and their defense. So they're probably doing very similar intensities. The difference primarily comes from um, some of our specialists, uh, specifically the face-off guys in, the, in their sprint demands and sprint activity. Um, we, it looks like we send the, the non-starters do a lot more of that face-off work and, and, and running there for, for those groups. But overall, we found a lot of similarities in terms of the difference between stars and non-stars. And this is great for the coaching staff. That means they're not losing any of the, the conditioning that you'd expect from practice between a non-starter and a starter. The, star, the non-starters are getting enough reps that they are conditioned equal to their stars. So if they did have to get pulled into a game, they would be ready and, and equal to the, the task physiologically. Um, and that's kind of like where we are right now with our, our lacrosse data. Um, we have uh, quite a bit more analyzation to do. We, we're looking to, to, and I'll show at the end, of how do we apply this information to the real world? But, I mean, this is all these are papers that are currently in the process of being, being out there for publication. Um, but this is information we use right now for our sports teams. They're actively using this information we're collecting and how do we do that? One of the examples I have is what we've done with soccer. Um, we've done this with soccer the longest since 2018. Um, we had two good years and then a, a year and a half of not so good. <laughs> and now we're back with um, one of my, our, our junior ex -phys students who has been very successful at, at managing this process for us, which has been really, really fun to see. 
But this is kind of what we've seen from the breakdown over the years. So this is the sum total of various seasons uh, demarcated into various types of opportunities that we've looked at. So one thing we see right away is female soccer players run more than men, men's lacrosse players. Uh, we're looking at 5K for a men's lacrosse player. We're looking at somewhere between uh, four and uh, eight, potentially up to 14K, almost to 14K during games on the, on the high end for, for a female soccer player. So their, their aerobic capacity demand is much higher. So that tells us we need more aerobic capacity for a soccer player than we do probably for uh, a lacrosse player. Um, we looked at this across the different seasons. Our preseason, which really is only eight days, which is, which is an issue we have with Division Three versus some of the other upper divisions that I compare this information to. Uh, our in-season it, it was something that I wanted to look at, and then how that compares to our ODAC postseason, and then compare that to our NCAA interaction where um, it, it's something really interesting to see. Now, with respect to work grade, this was the, the interesting thing that the coaches really uh, embarked upon uh, working with, with their athletes, is looking at, well, how does the seasons affect their work grade? How many minutes, uh, meters per minute are they doing in these activities? And what we found was there was a significant change when we, when we approached NCAAs. Um, again, that's our high competition, that's the people who are one of these years where we played Messiah and then CNU. Yeah, so CNU and Messiah in back-to-back -back days. So that, that incorporates a, a pretty high load with, with terms of stress for these athletes. But what we did see is, you know, low, low levels in the preseason, which makes sense, short time frame. Uh, uh, still trying to figure out team dynamics, cultural shift, you're, you know, trying to figure out who works where and what positions. So there are a lot of testing components a lot less of conditioning that they're doing with respect to that, whereas the in-season is doing a lot more conditioning activities day to day, uh, and that brings our postseason, and then the demand of games primarily from an NCAA perspective. When we look at our, our distances and, and activities that we have with, with soccer, specifically with respect to distance, we see a relatively close relationship, whereas lacrosse was a little bit different, soccer seems to be a little bit more stable in what's happening on the field during practice is happening uh, in, in the game. Uh, and one of the things we think for this is our coach typically does a lot more large field uh, scrimmages, whereas lacrosse does a lot of half field type drills and activities, which may accompany for practice and scrimmages being relatively in uh, high, high volume, specifically work distance coverage. Um, now this is something we call the six in the group, I, I, I shared it with them, but this is their sprint distance. So this is how much sprint distance do they have to do for a, a, a game of so in soccer. So here we have practices at 20 to 28 uh, meters, whereas games are at, at 49, um, which is a pretty good difference between what I just showed and lacrosse. Um, so that's a, a pretty good example that they still need high intensity anaerobic capacity in conjunction with the aerobic capacity I just mentioned of covering 14 kilometers in a game, potentially in a game. Um, so they do have to sprint pretty, pretty intense and, and good distances. And that might be dependent upon something we'll talk about next, which is what is their style of play, which is the, the last project we've done with, with our soccer team. Um, when we look at, 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 in terms of the positions, one of the things that is classically determined is that midfield does run more in uh, soccer compared to the other positions. And that is something that we found. I just wanted to put it out there that, yeah, we do see a little bit more of a midfield uh, uh, rise comparatively to the other, specifically in those games. Um, and when you ask people about that, that visually that makes sense. Whereas in lacrosse, Visually, you think that, but then something else seems to show up in the data. Um, and, and when we look at those sprints in, in terms of the midfield specifically, um, that's where they see a lot of their demand. Midfielders have to cover more distance, but they also have to sprint a lot more during competitions um, than in practices, which is something that we um, had discussions about, well, how does this play a role in um, the, the game style? And that was something that came up with uh, a direct question from, from Coach Olson to his team manager, who is uh, Mackenzie Green. She's a junior in the program. 
if you don't know her story, she has a, a pretty interesting story that led her here to managing the lacrosse program. But she took on our GPS stuff um, pretty openly and has been very active in helping us run that from uh, this perspective. But she put this project together based on what Coach Olson wanted to know. And with, with Division Three soccer, one of the issues we have is we can't recruit for the type of play we want to have. We do have to consider who we get able to get, who has the best skills, and then how does our playing style match the skills that we have. Whereas in Division One, you typically can, you know, you know, grease the pot a little bit and, and get someone you want to come in and play the position you need covered for your playing style. As a result, coach typically will have to change his playing style up every year, depending upon the, the quality uh, and the skills of the athletes that he has in the various positions. And he asked uh, Mackenzie to go back and look at some of our, our numbers from the previous years, specifically two back-to-back -back years where we played two specific different playing styles, and said, well, what happened to those players? What do we need to do in the future to prepare them? Because we're going to do this playing style next year. Um, and what we looked at is he wanted to know, well, what was the effect of playing a 3-4-3 versus a 3-5-2? And those of you interested in um, the nuances of soccer, 3-5-2. Um, uh, we work from defense to forward, uh, left to right. So three defense, four midfield, three offense versus three defense, five midfield, and two offense. And that's what we were looking at with respect to what's the difference in terms of the positions here. Uh, one thing we did note is that you know there's no difference between the duration of play, which is great because we wanted to make sure they were playing the same amount of time, so the distances are relatively equal. That's something that we want, especially in soccer, where they can go into overtimes and how the overtimes play out. Um, and what we found is that there was definitely a significant difference between position and style, which we just showed in the previous slide. That you know the run distance, the jog distance, sprint efforts, hard running, work rate. And intensity was difference across the traditional uh, perspective with the positions, which so we just wanted to make sure we were seeing the same types of information from previous things. But we found, you know, sprint distance and walk distance was no different. So uh, what we're finding is the style of play didn't affect those activities very much. But when we looked at the the individual comparisons, when we looked at a three-five-two versus a, a three-four-three midfield was impacted the most significantly when we played a 3-5-2. So that's the top chart. So 3-5-2, two, two forwards, five midfield, and three defensemen. Midfield had to work more during those activities. Um, when we looked at intensity, which uh, I, I talked about was, was not comparable across different units, but it was something we wanted to use in this uh, in information. Midfield also had a greater load in a 3-5-2 versus a 3-4-3. Three, three. Granted, the forwards also increased, but the biggest increase was from those midfielders in midfield positions. And that hypothesis came from, primarily we think that was from, we look back at the data, those were our outside midfielders. We didn't classify them as separately, but those were our outside midfielders. Those were the ones who were moving up consistently trying to close the open space that exists from the missing spots in, in the two, two levels. Um, I don't know why those came across so fastly, but I just said that. Let's do it quickly. <laughs> Copy and paste doesn't work all the time. Um, but when we look at that, we're, we're, we're seeing that they had to move forward much more often to try to fill the open gaps. And if there were five of you in the midfield, five individuals in the midfield, they had to find more spaces to move around to create the open space in soccer, whereas in lacrosse, they can do that a little bit more effectively with passing, uh, passing techniques. The balls were moving a little faster. Um, so for the students, the student athletes, for the, the women, they had to spend a lot more time creating motion and movement within the middle of the field and forward to make sure they fill those gaps to create the open space for the ball movement to go around. So this was very informative to coach because he decided hey, he's gonna he's gonna be running a three four five two that this season, um, and he needed to make sure that they were ready for that from the off season. So what's the summary that we we found so far with respect to um, soccer and lacrosse activity? Uh, one thing we do know is that there's variability in loads and stress, which is affected by position, activity type, and competition level. 
all of those things are going to have significant differences with respect to what's happening. And it takes a coach to actually know how to work around some of these differences to make sure that the student athletes are, are rested, recovered <coughs> well, but also get the most out of their off-season or in-season training to perform effectively. Uh, the highest loads were experienced in defensive players in lacrosse and midfielders in soccer. The midfielders in soccer is supported by a lot of the, the research from all divisions of, of soccer. The lacrosse, this was a relatively new, so um, we'll be working over the summer and going to come back and let you know. <laughs> we have to do this. Uh, from a high competition game, we, we are seeing some similarities from a, a, a soccer and a lacrosse perspective is that those do increase the workload. So when we do have back-to-back -back NCAA type qualifying games, we may have more levels of fatigue for our athletes. And from all levels, from a coach to a strength coach to athletic training, that's good things to know in terms of how to mitigate potential outcomes with, with our athletes, both good and bad. The starters experience higher loads during practice in, in soccer uh, and a little bit with, with in lacrosse, but not as much. And, and the one thing that we found the, the most significant from a training perspective is the distance that sprints are done are greater than 20 meters. We've been doing a lot of 10 meter type sprint performance work and may need to push that beyond because it's probably not a one-to-one -one relationship for what's actually happening in the game. Um, now, from a practical application perspective, this data, while being done for research purposes, it's also shared with our coaches, uh, our strength coach staff, and our uh, sports re medicine rehab, rehab groups. They all have access to this data um, that can help plan daily activities, daily changes, individual changes from a work to rest ratio perspective. Um, one thing we do is, you know, we make sure that the athletes are, are not overly fatigued. Uh, and this is a good way to, to say, hey, this athlete or these groups of athletes or the whole team, you know, may need, may need a rest. Uh, and that, that really helps with the coaching. Um, whether they can make the decision or not, it's up to them, but they, they, they need more, they want more information. They're looking for this information to be brought to them on a regular basis to make good weekly and daily planning adjustments for their players. From a strength and conditioning perspective, uh, Coach Smith as well as Coach Deacon have, have used this information to really gauge their in-season and out-of-season training pr uh, programs as well as working with a rehabbing athlete to make sure they know what they need to get into for a return to play. Um, their return to play is gonna be dictated whether or not they can do what the on-field GPS is seeing in games and practices so they can match that and be ready to go, to go for that. And then uh, sports medicine with our, uh, our great athletic training staff have been using this for rehab purposes as well, making sure that they're getting into uh, both an aerobic and an anaerobic conditioning. And a, a good example is a few years ago, our soccer athlete was, um, we found that she was very well, well prepared for uh, the aerobic demand. She was doing the mileage, she was doing the speeds at the distance, but then we looked at, she wasn't doing the sprints. So the uh, athletic training staff decided, okay, we'll, we'll move away from a little bit of that aerobic demand. Let's start doing some wind sprints uh, to get them ready to go for the, for the competition. Um, so, this is very usable, uh, and I think a lot of groups on campus have been, uh, have gotten the value out of, out of this type of soft system, even though it is primarily used for our research purposes, but it also has really good practical use for our, our sports teams and games as they get prepared to compete for NCAA championships, which is the goal. All right, and that's all I have. Any questions?